All right. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for showing up tonight for D Man 851 Micro Project One panel discussions, uh, where I am a student at um, a doctoral student at Liberty University, and uh, tonight we're going to do panel discussion dealing with the diaconate as it relates uh, to biblical theology and also the diaconate as it relates to biblical selection. Uh, we will do two of those tonight, and I'm um, so glad that I have my panelists here with us tonight. I want to introduce our panelists, um, Dr. Terrence Scott. Amen. He have a D-man degree from South University, and he's the honor esteemed pastor of um, the Mount Moriah down in Moses, Alabama. Amen. Dr. Allen Sims um, got a degree, doctoral degree from United Theological Seminary in Dayton, Ohio. And he's on the pastor of the Dexter King Memorial Baptist Church. Pastor Fred Gray, he have a master's degree from Liberty University. And he's on the pastor of the First Baptist Church in Prattville, Alabama. And we have Pastor James McTier, uh, who have a master's degree from Selma University. And he is the on pastor of the Weeping Willow uh, Missionary Baptist Church. And we're going to go ahead and get started with our first panel discussion, and it's titled The Diaconate as it relates to, to biblical studies. Uh, Dr. Scott, uh, what is biblical theology and its importance to the ministry as a whole? Uh, biblical theology, when we look at the terms themselves, biblical, of course, meaning relating to scripture, theology, which comes from two Greek words, theos, and logos, uh, God and word. Anything in the English language with ology on it means the study of. So we look at that as the study of God's word. Uh, we look at these things systematically. Uh, systematic theology answers the question, what does the whole Bible say about any given subject? And as we look at the biblical theology of the diaconate, then we are looking at what the Bible says about the diaconate ministry, and that's how we want to approach our discussion tonight. Dr. Sims, what, what, what would you say about uh, biblical theology and that's its importance to the ministry as a whole? Uh, thank you, uh, Pastor Perry. I uh, agree with uh, Reverend Dr. Scott that um, when I think about biblical theology uh, and its importance to the ministry, uh, biblical theology is, is putting all the pieces together to tell the biblical story. Uh, it's telling the story of, of using a big picture view uh, to see the truth revealed and developed uh, across the ages. And it, what it does, it pays attention to uh, telling the story over time. Uh, for example, the, the creation, the fallen man, the flood, uh, and biblical theology can trace ideas through books by books. And so uh, uh, an example of that would be a tracing of the seeds. Uh, how did the seed move toward Jesus, uh, the descendants of Abraham, uh, the David, and those who follow Jesus become a part of the seed? And so, uh, again, for me, it, it's putting all the pieces together to tell the uh, big picture. Awesome. Um, Pastor Gray, what would you say about biblical theology and as it relates to ministry as a whole? I must agree with uh, Dr. Scott and well as Dr. Sims, uh, I look at it as telling the whole story, uh, the whole about the whole Bible, as a Christian scripture, and meaning that uh, we must uh, interpret the scripture uh, of the whole Bible as it relates uh, to all scriptures within uh, the Bible itself. All right, um, Pastor McTeer, uh, what would you say about biblical theology and as its importance to the ministry as a whole? Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Theology in general, um, as it has been so stated, is a human effort at understanding God. When you attach biblical to the idea of our quest for God, it puts it in a perspective that we need scripture in order to do that. And so biblical theology is your concept of God based on the word of God. I submit that. 
Dr. Scott, um, how does the concept of the diaconate align uh, with the principles of biblical theology? It aligns scripturally as <clears throat> the diaconate is a scriptural office that was instituted because of the need in the church. Uh, it aligns with ministry because ministry is all about serving the needs of the people. Uh, very re relevant uh, definition of ministry is meeting the needs of people and understanding what those needs may be. Uh, scripturally, this, this office was instituted because of the problem that arose in the church. And they were, as I said, um, uh, appointed to this duty. I like the English Standard Version when it says this duty uh, as opposed to this business because sometimes we get confused about what this ministry entails. Uh, but it, it, it aligns completely with, with Bible because it is scriptural. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sims, how has uh, the understanding and practices of the diaconate evolved in the history of Christianity? Uh, when you go back and you look at fact that Jesus came to serve. Uh, when you think about the seven that was chosen, they were chosen to serve. Uh, but if you were to go back to the Old Testament, there is a reference of the apostle origin of the diaconate uh, where it refers to the Levites and how they were uh, there to assist uh, the priest and the ministry. Uh, and, and so it's all about uh, serving. Uh, the, and, and there's an old Negro spiritual talks about serving this present age, uh, our fallen people as well. All right. Pastor Gray, uh, are there any misconceptions, uh, misunderstandings about the diaconate in biblical theology that we need, that need to be addressed? <coughs> that's an interesting question. Uh, uh, that's a, a question that uh, needs to be addressed and as we look at it, um, uh, Acts chapter 6 uh, points out uh, to us um, about uh, when the servants were first called. Um, and so we are servants. We don't want to, the misconception deal with the power struggle at times between the office of the deacon and the office of the pastor. Uh, the, when we are taught scripture, uh, that will eliminate any misconception or misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. And it all deals with training and having proper training and proper courses throughout uh, uh, the year or throughout the months. Of, of everybody understanding what their roles are in the church. And so when we learn scripture and study scripture, it ties back to biblical theology and that's studying the scripture. And once you understand the scripture, then you will understand your responsibility that you're called for. So scripture, scripture helps really um, cultivate our ministry. In other words, we're going to have a biblical ministry, then we need to make sure that we uh, use scripture to do that. That's okay. correct. Well, Pastor McTeer, what are some biblical passages or narratives that highlights uh, the importance of the diaconate in the life of the church and the community? Well, there are several passages that um, Paul calls our attention to. Um, for example, in um, his writings to Timothy in that um, chapter, third chapter, I think, of First Timothy, he gives him some um, strong advice when it comes to the selection of uh, deacons and uh, their qualifications for service, as well as in Titus, I think, um, one and nine. He gives some, some strong instructions there as well. Um, there are several narratives in the Bible where uh, deacons were often left in the place of those who were traveling missionaries. Their roles and responsibilities were to act in the absence of the apostles and to keep the fellowship on course uh, 
of course, with the use of scripture. And um, as it has been established, um, the role and function of the deacon was it, and is an extension of the pastor's office. Okay. Um, Dr. Scott, I, I, I see with our uh, contemporary uh, context of what we have in church now, uh, how can the concept of the diaconate be applied in practical terms when we're dealing with the contemporary church context? By contemporizing, as you're saying, contextualizing, making sure that we're bringing it into uh, the proper context of the church today without changing the meaning of the scripture. Uh, because scripture can never mean today what it was not meant to mean when it was written all of those years ago. So the meaning and the message does not change, but the means may have to change. And what I mean by that is, the reason I pointed out earlier that uh, English Standard Version says this duty because they were appointed to this particular duty in Acts 6, but the me needs of the church may be different today than they were then. They may not be serving tables in the, uh, the contextual sense of Acts 6, but they still are to be serving. So uh, just contextualizing that and contemporizing it to bring it to today's terms and for the church's need for today, the church's and the pastor's need for today. Okay. Pa pastor McTeer. Uh, how does the diaconate contribute to the overall mission and purpose of the church as is outlined in the Bible? They, they do that by remaining in a strong understanding of the pastoral role because the diaconate is an extension of the pastoral office. And so those two should be able to work uh, unanimously together and it causes a positive effect on the community of believers because there are certain responsibilities that the pastoral office requires of a pastor. For example, uh, devotional time, studying and so forth, so on. And, uh, and, and then depending on the size of the community, it cannot uh, service all of them alone, so it requires the need for those who carry his spirit, who carry the understanding of his office in order to be able to facilitate it on his behalf. Well, uh, thank you for your expertise on those uh, questions that we have asked. Uh, now we're going to open the floor up for uh, Q&A, questions and answers. Uh, anybody got any question that you want to uh, pose to one of these panelists. We ask that you come up to the podium and pose your question to the panelists and uh, direct your question to the panelists that you want to answer your question. So we're going to open the floor up now for you to come to um, the mic and ask your questions. of a deacon when the pastor is out ah. the deacon is there is no deacon am i right or wrong about that okay that's a good question and it's amazing that you asked that question because early in my preparation that did come to mind if you don't mind i want to share um a few excerpts out of my own personal devotion this morning it, it requires a level of understanding uh, when it comes to the absence of a pastor in the role of a deacon, it, 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 it requires a strong biblical understanding. Um, an understanding of that relationship that causes a, a deacon to remain in the state and status of his function. Um, I think what has, has happened and caused um, much confusion in many of our churches is let me see, I wrote it down. Um, transition issue. When, whenever churches go through a period of being without a pastor, deacons often rise to carry out certain ordinances of the church. And if there's not a strong faithfulness to 
his role scripturally. It's so close to the pastoral office that the power infringement can take place. And, and, and if you're not careful, they'll operate in the pastoral manner. And when the pastor returns or when the pastor comes, they have trouble relinquishing that responsibility. Um, I think in, in my study of the history of the Akhenit, and I, I had to get it from uh, Catholicism, from the Catholic Church, that there was an issue like that uh, at one point, uh, AD 57 come to mind, when they had to get rid of the diaconate in the Catholic Church because of this issue of power struggle, as Pastor Gray said. And um, the bishop decided to dismantle it, so they did not have an office of deacons at one period, but because of, of, of the, the load uh, requirement on the priest, they ended up reinserting the diaconate back into the order of their function. So what I'm saying, this is not something that's just limited to our experience. It's a mindset that any of us can have when we don't stay close to God and operate in the presence of the Spirit of God and commit to the Word of God, we'll usurp authority that God has not given us. Good evening. Good evening. Um, just one question. Um, just as a new pastor comes into a church and he takes over, should there also be a new bringing in of deacons? Should deacons also go through a trial period with the pastor? He go through his trial period. And I'll be which way to hear that. Yeah. That's a good question. Most of the time, um, thank you uh, for the. Uh, question, uh, the deacons are already set uh, in that position. And so as the new pastor comes along, um, as part of we talked about the transition, uh, it, it, it's, it's good to hopefully establish a relationship, uh, have had established a relationship uh, while you was candidating for the church. But once you get to church, then um, it's a good time to uh, reintroduce yourself to the church and then kind of um, um, uh, work with the deacons. Um, spend some time with your deacons. Get to know your deacons. Uh, when I was in the military as an officer, uh, when I was assigned to my unit, the best person to help me out was an enlisted uh, person, a sergeant. And so if I listen, then um, uh, it'll kept me out of trouble. But the times when I got in trouble was because I didn't listen. And then there are some times that I believe that God will always put a deacon uh, in your life, in your ministry, that will uh, help you, that assist you. But still with that, you have to be careful um, uh, because people do turn. Uh, but I always believe that God will put somebody there on that, on that ministry to, to help you show you the ropes. Biblically, the apostles told the church to look out, look out among them and to choose seven men who were full of the spirit and you know had all of those other qualifications. I think that it is important, uh, and I think uh, we're getting, kind of getting ahead of ourselves here, but we, I think it is important that the pastor have had some relationship with the candidate that has been chosen. Uh, biblically, that's how we're supposed to do it. I think uh, practically uh, the pastor ultimately chooses the deacons. Now, the way we do it at Mount Moriah number two, the, the candidate uh, has gone through some trial period and then after I approve, then they're brought before the church. Uh, and I think that conversation came up, you know, who, who gives this woman to be married? Oh, no, that wasn't the question, it was, uh, uh, does anybody see fit that this woman should not be married to this man? So it's kind of that 
type of ordeal where the church has the opportunity to speak up to say whether or not. But biblically, the church is supposed to choose its deacons, but I think that the pastor should have an active role uh, since that's who he's going to have to work with most closely uh, are those deacons. Pastor Perry, can I um, offer a question to the panel? What is the best way to handle inherited misunderstanding? We talked about training and training the ones that are with you. But what happens when you inherit the lack of training among people now that you have to work with whose mindsets may have been fixed in such a way to believe that the diaconate is, is what they think as opposed to what scripture teaches? I, I think most pastors and I think I'm safe in saying this, assume that people know things when they go into churches. And we assume that even the membership knows what the church is and what the church's function is and what the church's duty is. And I think as a new pastor, it is our responsibility to teach and to train. Uh, of course, the saying goes, it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks, and sometimes they have been so, uh, I don't even want to say indoctrinated because they hadn't been taught this, um, truthfully taught, they have, they have kind of followed the example of somebody else, which is a danger to us as pastors uh, when they are misled down that road that you're talking about. But I think that while the, the pastorate is fresh, while they, they don't really know you haven't formed their opinion about you yet, that you should take that time to, to blindly, and when I say blindly, I don't mean that we don't know what we're teaching, but that they don't think we have an agenda in teaching because we're new and we want to make sure that the church is trained. And at the same time, taking those deacons through training, we need to take those churches through some training. Stephen Covey said, um, uh, seek first to understand and then secondly, to be understood. And so um, I, I think for the new pastor uh, coming in is to try to understand where they're coming from. Uh, what is it that they know or do not know uh, before you start sharing your agenda and then see if there's some way that we can kind of work together knowing that the ultimate responsibility is mine to teach and to guide and to lead. And uh, hopefully they will um, they'll work with me. Let me just uh, throw this. I, I, I truly believe that developing relationship with individuals, because a deacon is very important to the church. And so therefore, it's important that we develop relationship. I, I, I've been uh, at one church, and I'm going on 47 years, and uh, I I believe that um, uh, being there every day, uh, uh, most of the officers that serves on the board at First Baptist, uh, they come by the church and, and we have this relationship and we have disagreement. But my thing of it is, is that we both serving uh, in the kingdom of God and so we want what's best for the church. And, and therefore, I look at it from the standpoint, if you serve in, in this office, I, I, you should want what's best for the church. Uh, forget about your personal opinion. And that's the way I go at it, is developing that relationship. In any organization, you're gonna have disagreement. But the bottom line is, is you serving for self-gain or are you serving to uh, meet the requirement that the Lord requests of us? And so I, 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 I think it's relationship. And sometimes it's, it's you, you may go through a few years and have bad relationships. Mm -hmm. But then if you really say, if you really meet the standards in which you... Um, 
the office that you hold, then you can come to an agreement. Pastor mm -hmm. McTeer, also, I think transparency uh, is important, too, that, they, they, that you keep them aware of what's going on um, uh, and, and hope that they may not keep you aware, yeah. but at least you uh, show transparency. Right. Those, those are wonderful working solutions, and I'm sure uh, our brothers appreciate those. And I, I was somewhat speaking primarily to the young preacher who may be seminary trained or not trained, but who gets an opportunity to go to an already established church that deacon board may be as old as the church is and through the lack of strong pastoral tenure, one of my first churches, they had a turnover of pastoral leadership, which nobody had a real chance of establishing the training and the teaching that you are referring to. And I ask that because some young pastor would ask me, what would, what, what would my thoughts be in a situation like that? So I thank you all for your comments. Amen, great, great question. Um, my aim for these panel's discussion, for this panel's discussion is to allow deacons and pastors to know that we are not opponents. We don't fight against each other. We are on the same team. And we are on the same team trying to meet a certain goal, and that's trying to glorify our God and get lost souls saved. And once we understand our concept of our togetherness, then we can take on how good and how pleasant it is for brothering to dwell together in unity. And that's what the aim is for this. And um, thank you for your questions. Uh, thank you all for your answers. I'm going to give each one of you now, let's close out. I'm going to give each one of you about 40, 40 seconds just to just give me a, just a little summary. Just 40 seconds because we're about to close out. Amen. Uh, thank you uh, for uh, inviting me to be a part of this. I've enjoyed, uh, and I think it's beneficial and necessary. Was that, was that 20 seconds of my, of my time? Uh, uh, just to give a recap, we are um, talking about biblical theology and how it relates to the diaconate ministry, um, of course, relating it to scripture, uh, tying it back to scripture, contextualizing and contemporizing to make sure that it's relevant for the church today, but that it's still pleasing God. Again, thank you also for this opportunity to be a part of this panel. Uh, uh, for me, just uh, working together, uh, having an understanding, knowing what biblical theology is, and, uh, and, and trying to find that area, that common ground, where all of us can work together instead of working against each other, because we really are in this thing together. Well, y'all done did it all. I, I, I just believe that uh, both offers, uh, we are leaders. And we should demonstrate ourselves as leader uh, to improve the church, the body of Christ. And that's what I emphasize uh, uh, all the time with the brethren. We are a team. And so, therefore, we are looking for what's best for the church that we serve. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Perry. Um, I just appreciatively applaud you for your effort of bringing us back to biblical context with the things that mean the most to the church. I think our future success hangs and hinges on our understanding of how important biblical theology really is. Amen. Thank you again, uh, all our panelists. Thank you so much for your expertise that you have given this audience today. And thank you, audience, for uh, being here. And thank you for your questions. And um, Continue to just keep, grow and let's be together and let, 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 let us know that when it comes to the diaconate ministry, it is not something that we just um, count lightly, but it is something that we really is dear to the church. It is very vital to the church, uh, the deacon ministry. It is not someone that, that wait tables and all that. It is not a, 
I, I tell the deacons here at Good Ship that you are not maintenance men. You are, sir, you, you are spiritual men. The deacon ministry is spiritual, and that's what we are trying to uh, gain and let them know that they are spiritual men and not maintenance men. And we thank you, and we, we applaud you for being here, and we applaud these panelists for being here and giving us their expertise. And God bless you. All right. We're going to pause for about three minutes, and we're going to go into biblical selection. Uh, these panel discussions have been
good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us tonight for our DMN 851 Micro Project 1 panel discussion. This is panel discussion 2, um, entitled The Arcanate as it pertains to biblical selection. Uh, I want to thank you for being here tonight. Um, I want to introduce my panelist, uh, Dr. Scott, uh, who is uh, have a DMN from South University. Uh, Dr. Sims is um, have a D-man from United Theological Seminary, and uh, Pastor Gray, who have his master's from Liberty, and Pastor McTeer, who have his master's from Selma um, University. And we thank you all for being here. So tonight we will uh, start with this um, diaconate as it relates to the biblical selection. In other words, uh, how the Bible says that we should uh, select uh, the diaconate, or uh, the deacons, or uh, the servants. How, how, how do we go about uh, doing it God's way? And that's what we're going to try to aim to uh, bring some resolve to doing it the way God, God wanted done. And with that being said, um, Pastor Gray, I want to ask you, what criteria do you believe should be considered when selecting individuals for the diaconate ministry? Following the scripture in Acts chapter 6, um, from somewhere around the third verse, uh, it gives us uh, the process. That's where the process began. And first of all, it talks about if you're going to select somebody, should, they should be an earnest individual. Uh, secondly, it talks about they ought to be full of the Holy Ghost. And thirdly, it mentioned, they ought to have wisdom. And so, if you're going to put somebody in a, a position as a servant, as a deacon of the church, uh, uh, you ought to see that uh, in that person uh, before you just uh, place them in that position. So often we put people in position just because we like them or they come to church or whatever. But do they really have that uh, criteria uh, to serve in that capacity? Because uh, this, is, this is serious business. This is serious uh, carrying out uh, the business of the kingdom. And, and, and after all, we, we talk about they are uh, serving uh, to handle the business of the church. And sometimes we get that confused. Uh, what type of business are they to carry out? Uh, but if you desire an office, you ought to want to have those characteristics of it. Uh, so uh, I, I look at it as we go from Acts chapter 6 and then you transition to Paul writing in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and looking somewhere around verse 8 down to around verse 13, it gives you all those qualities that you need to serve in this office. So, so scriptures uh, gives us the criteria we need mm -hmm. when it comes to selecting individuals for this ministry. Yes. Okay, so if we just go to the scripture. Go to the scripture. Okay, we can find out what uh, we need in order to insert someone in the ministry of the diaconate. When you go back to biblical theology, and when you look at the definition of biblical theology, we are talking about scripture. Okay. If your church ought to be sound, it have to be scriptorial. Mm. Okay. And so, therefore, we who are serving in any leadership capacity ought to understand scripture and has full knowledge of 
the job that are required of you. Okay. All right. So selecting them. Dr. Scott, um, since we know that scripture uh, give us the criteria, what kind of training and formation should be provided to candidates uh, who are selected for the diaconate ministry, and how can this training equip them? Besides doing the biblical training, uh, looking at the characteristics and qualifications, making sure that they align with what scripture says in order to be effective and function in this office, we also need to look at uh, the needs of the ministry. Uh, there's no cookie cutter training. What you need here, someone else may not need. I think it's important that the church, uh, and more pointedly the pastor, look at the needs and the expectations of those individuals who are going to be in this ministry and make sure that that training is done looking from a biblical standpoint, making sure that we are aligning with scripture and uh, making sure that what we're doing is scriptural. But we, we need to make sure that the function of the church is also um, uh, cared for and, 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 and duly aligned with um, our mission. Um, teaching uh, Christian doctrine right now, we've talked about the role and the function of the church today. And three things that come to mind were first evangelism, uh, then worship, and thirdly, social concern. Well, what is the duty of the deacons? In our last session, someone said that they, uh, uh, that, that they need to be equipped to do uh, the work of the ministry as related to uh, the body of Christ. Well, when we think about what the body of Christ is, it's not just good ship. It's not just Mount Moriah number two, but it is making sure that we are looking out at evangelism. We come here to train. We come here to worship for corporate worship. And then our duty is in, as the parable says, the hedges and the highways compelling them to come in. It is about making sure of social concern, which is why uh, the office of deacon was instituted in the first place, uh, to look out after the needs of the people. Well, that doesn't just mean uh, in the confine of the four walls. That also means in the community. Uh, I think Pastor McTeer was the one who said it, that the pastor can't be everywhere all at the same time. Uh, the pastor cannot do all of the things that need to be done. And for that reason, these men are selected. And then they need to be trained with the expectations of the pastor, of the ministry, and of the community to make sure that they're being effective in their role. Okay. Um, pastor McTeer, how important is it for candidates to have a strong spiritual foundation and a deep understanding of the gospel message. I think that's very important from the angle of spiritual warfare. Let me take it from that aspect, if you don't mind. I think when we go back and look at Acts and we see the formation of the church coming together, it was basically the apostle and the people. We would put it in today's vernacular, the pastor and people. R really, the church encompasses the relationship between the man of God, the under shepherd, and the people of God. The, the need for a diaconate came because, as Pastor Scott said, the, the need became great because of the growth and the furtherance of the movement. But it becomes a matter to me of spiritual maturity. You, you have to have enough word in you in order to ward off spirits that would oppose you being a, a good deacon. I think it's important to be rooted and grounded in the word of God because of the challenges you will have to face that will uproot you out of your understanding of your function. Some of us know better, but we don't do better. And so it, it, it's, it's so important. I think what you look for is not just a good man, but a mature man. And, 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 and that is important. A person can be a, a social phenomenon. He can be a good person outside of the church, but that won't make him a good spiritually minded deacon in the church. You need, you, need, you need the word of God in order to put you in a place of spiritual maturity and understanding where in the absence of the pastor, not only can you feed the flock, but you can protect them too. Mm. All right. Uh, doc, doc, Dr. Sims, 
um, how can the selection process ensure diversity and inclusivity in terms of gender, ethnicity, and background among the candidates for the diaconate? Thank you. Um, let me begin by saying um, your view of God will determine how you serve God. And all of us have views. If you have a conservative, you, there's a conservative view, there is a, a moral, I mean, a, um, a moderate view, and then there is a liberal view. So uh, it, it also determines how you come to scripture and how you look at scripture. You can look at it from a conservative view or moderate view or a liberal view. For example, uh, that, that one about women keep silent in the church. The conservative view looks at that as black and white. Women shouldn't say anything. The moderate view looks at that and say, well, women can say something, but, 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 but they, they can only say so much. But a liberal view gives them the opportunity to say whatever they need to say. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you have uh, 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 what is called embedded theology. Uh, that embedded theology is the things that we've been taught uh, or somebody's taught us uh, since we were kids or, or um, um, and, and that's ingrained in us, that's embedded in us. So when it comes down to women uh, in, in ministry or women being deacon, uh, maybe it's been embedded in us that that, uh, that ought not to be so. And so um, um, you move from embedded theology uh, to challenge what to deliberative theology that challenge your embedded theology. For example, uh, when I was coming up, I was not allowed to uh, 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 iron my shirt on Sunday. And so, uh, but when I went into the, that, because it was embedded in me. But when I went into the military, then uh, uh, I, I realized that I had to iron my shirt because I had a function that day. That became deliberate to me. So uh, when it comes to making sure that there is diversity uh, we have to challenge, um, uh, the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave. That world is anybody. And that's everybody that's going to be in your church. There'll be some women in your church. There'll be men in your church. Uh, there'll be black and white in your church. And you have to make a decision. Uh, when you look at the text, uh, who is he talking about? What is he talking about? What's the context of the text uh, when you make your decision? Um, uh, for me, at Dexter, we have women uh, deacons at our church. Uh, we started that in, in 1967. And there was a conflict with the National Baptist Convention. And so uh, Dexter was kicked out of the convention. And so we joined the Progressive uh, uh, ba National Baptist Convention, one with Dr. King who had started, because he believed in diversity. He believed that uh, everybody had a share, an equal right to be part of the ministry. And, um, and, and that's kind of like where I am too. But, but my view of the scripture on diversity and equity and uh, inclusion mm -hmm. uh, is, is important. If we can practice it out here, how come we cannot practice it in church? Pastor Gray, um, what do you think about the selection process uh, ensure diversity and inclusivity in terms of gender, ethnicity, and background among candidates for the diaconate. You know, Paul uh, talks about it in Romans. Uh, in matter of fact, the 16th chapter of Romans, uh, verse 1, uh, Paul talks, if you, uh, talked about Phoebe was a servant at the church. What has happened to our church? And I'm um, I want to see we all churches you'll have a constitution or a bylaw. Some churches bylaw a constitution may read that it's all males who will serve on the board of deacons, so that excludes any woman uh, or women to serve in that capacity. But I don't like for us to major in marriage. Mm -hmm. And what do you mean, Pastor, about? There are certain churches that don't even have men to serve in the role of a deacon. And you have women who are 
able to serve, if the Lord is going to stop her from entering the kingdom because she's doing, or is we going to keep this old mentality that women can't serve? And I'm not going one way or the other here uh, on it because at our church, we only have men, 24 of them, to be exact, on the board. And it's all. No one has ever in my 46 years recommended a woman to serve on our board of deacons. It's because uh, it's been taught down through this is, this board is made simply for men to serve. And so, therefore, you have to look at the historical background of the church in which you are part of. And so, they, they may have bylaws uh, that says that women cannot serve on the board of deacons. Awesome. Okay, let me ask you this. Uh, if, 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 why do we approach scripture with presuppositions? When we, when you approach scripture with presuppositions, then you you challenging scripture. Mm -hmm. Okay, so who wins the challenge, scripture or you? So I want I'm, this one. I want so what I'm what I want. So I'm gonna let each one of you give. Me, thank you, uh, Dr. Sims. Thank you, Dr. Gray. Now, Pastor McTeer, if we approach a scripture with a presupposition, that means that that scripture got to change us. Uh, either we gonna try to change that scripture. So with Romans chapter 16, verse 1, uh, which that word servant is the same as diakados. That's the same word, which means servant. And Paul called Phoebe a deacon. So now how would you combat that when it comes to selection? When scripture, now we can believe Paul, watch this. We can believe Paul in 1 Timothy 3. We can believe his qualifications, but we can't believe his selection in Romans 16. So, I, so give me some background on that uh, when it comes to selection with diversity, uh, inclusivity, and uh, gender. And okay, for, first of all, um, we all know isogeneity is always dangerous. We never le lead into scripture our thoughts and preconceived notions. We want to always exegete. We want to get an understanding of what the Bible is saying and then bring the meaning and context of what it is saying into our lives. I think um, as I sit here and ponder as, as, as the guys talk tonight, Paul dealt situationally with the issues as the church developed. As Pastor Gray said, there were certain times when there was no men available, perhaps that the responsibility of the, 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 of the diaconate, which is the office, but let's not confuse the function. M maybe she can't have the office, but she can be a diaconia, a servant, in the sense of carrying out a function without wearing a title. But I think Paul deals situationally, especially through Corinthians and many of the letters, through the current situations in those churches at that time because he had to further his missionary journey and he had to leave somebody behind to instruct the community and to protect the community and to keep them on course. And if there's nobody there but Aquila and Priscilla, he had to leave them there in order to keep the fellowship going. So the, the woman's role is invaluable. You cannot put value on that. It, 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 you know, but at the same time, it becomes a struggle when our understanding of biblical theology is fractured by situations and circumstances that we try to interpret and lead our thoughts into scripture mm -hmm. instead of allowing scripture to determine how we form the fellowship where we are. Amen. Amen. <laughs> great, great, great expertise. I, 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 I got to move now to question and answer because we, 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 we need to get these questions. So if you have a question uh, at this time, please come to the podium and uh, ask the question and 
direct it to the panelists that you would um, like to answer your question. in the Baptist Church for many years uh, have done what I call go along to get along. And I said that to say this. When I was a young man, women weren't allowed to do very much in the church per se, much less preach even. And if they did preach, they could not go into the pulpit. Now, I don't know where that came from, but it was just passed along. Okay, now, we just talked about not doing things that are not, well, about doing things that are not scripturally based. One of the things that I do realize is that we have to know our responsibilities and also our limitations as deacons. I had a, a good friend who was the minister and now who pastors his own church tell me at one point in time, you must make sure that every decision that you make is scripturally based. And as long as you do that, you won't have anything to worry about. So we talk about, and I know that each of you know who Phoebe was. So with Phoebe having been a deacon, does that open the door then? for women to be deacons in the Baptist church or not? Pastor Gray, he, he directed that to you. Oh, now it would take somebody who grew up with me to throw that <laughs> question at me. Uh, since Deacon and I from the same place and, and um, but I, 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 I'm a firm believer is that if we stay scripture, you can't go wrong. I, I, I'm, I'm not saying, I, I go back to what I stated earlier. Churches have constitution. You voted on, this is how we are gonna operate the church. Uh, I, you know, you, you abide and by that constitution whether it's scriptoria or not. Uh, at First Baptist, if we do not have it in our bylaws, but no one has uh, ever recommended uh, a female to be a deacon at our church. Scriptorial, I brought that up from reading and going through studies uh, is that I use that as an example that just because I do not have females at First Baptist, that don't mean that Mount Moriah number two can't have them if that's what they want. And so that's where I'm at on this. I like what Pastor Mike Tier said. Things happen depending on situation. Uh, you know, sometimes they said they don't want a woman to usurp the authority and they, they use this particular scripture to justify why they don't want um, a, a woman to be the head of something. But that's not always the case. It's just based on. I'm, I'm staying with the scripture. The scripture says it, and I will follow the scripture. Any more questions? Good afternoon. Uh, being on both sides of the aisle, I like to get that clear when I'm thankful. Uh, for a long time, uh, pastoral and deacon, uh, superintendent, trustee. I think and know pretty much as I addressed it in Bible college the other night. Poor teaching is our problem. It has nothing to do with the Bible right or wrong. It has to do with 
I will poor teach you. First thing you want to ask yourself is, and I asked myself as I dealt with it, what did the Bible say? What does the Bible say concerning the issue of a deacon, male or female? And what does the Bible say, and why? how do I put it? I think Paul addressed it, and if you go back to the Old Testament, uh, it addressed somewhere in Leviticus concerning an issue. So mm -hmm. I, I want to know, do you, can you give me what the Bible says concerning that issue and how you're going to teach it? Who you want to address that? Uh, Pastor Scott, Dr. Scott, you want to answer that? I wouldn't, I, we would like to take it. I'll put it that Dr. way. Is there one of you would like to take that if I put it that way? He called my name. I guess I'll. Uh, <laughs> uh, biblically, it is. It is. I don't want to use the word permissible, but uh, biblically, it is um, right. Uh, the Bible does talk about uh, women being deacons, but I think that uh, Dr. Sims said it best when he said it being embedded. Uh, in us, and I looked, and I know y'all thought I was looking at my phone, looking at a call or something, but I wanted to make sure that I wasn't wrong. Uh, conservatively, as he said, or uh, orthodox evangelicals even would look at the scripture where it says, look out among you and find seven men, and take that as being uh, that only men can have that office. But as you look further in scripture, Phoebe has come up several times tonight, it is scriptural for women to serve as deacons. I, I'm of the same mindset as, as Pastor Gray. In, in the 15 years that I've pastored, the two churches that I've pastored, no woman has ever been suggested to be a deacon. Then we had a discussion last night about deaconess and the role of deaconess. I, I think Pastor uh, Perry and I talked about this maybe even before the session. Uh, uh, the role of deaconess and how we have uh, placed them as not being equal to a deacon, but having a role in the church as a ministry of women who serve in a certain capacity. And I think that we have never just addressed the office of deaconess to be that as equal of that as a deacon, but one that complements it, if you will. Uh, how would you teach that if it became uh, an issue? Because I'm not going to cause one. Uh, uh, oh, do y'all hear me tonight? I'm not going to cause one. But if it became one where somebody was suggested, because look out among you, as I said earlier, and it is the church's responsibility to say, hey, I think that this individual would serve well, then if it was an issue in the church, then I would teach that it is a biblical and scriptural thing, uh, and it is right. It would be okay. Amen. I know one more, one more point. And then we, I'm, we gonna gonna have, I'm gonna have to close it out in a minute. Get, uh, this is the last question, Deacon White. You just do your question uh, once we close the 30 minutes out. Go ahead. Has there ever been laid before the church, each church, a constitution and bylaws to the deacon that they come in and t when once they become, once they are uh, been asked or once they've been given the right to be a deacon before they are ordained. They, here go your constitution, here go your bylaw. You need to study that so you can know what you are taking on. Uh, as they stated, Professor Taylor the other night, he said our problem is we let a person take on an office and they don't know what it's all about. And once they take it on, they find out what it's all about, then they make, they make up what they want and what they will do. So I, that's what I would like to say. Pastor Gray, just, I just want to say this. I, I, when you say constitution and bylaws, that, that pertains to the membership at large. So, so I think what you're really saying is, are they being given the duties? Sure. The duties, yeah, because the constitution and bylaws would be for the membership at large, which they already would be covered under as a member. I, I, I was going to say, if when someone recommend uh, an individual to serve on the Board of Deacons, we have that to hand them in the interview process? Are you willing to follow uh, what's before you? And so in that interview now, when this recommend for deacons at 
where I've been for over 40 years. Uh, I have an interview process once the person is selected, uh, they are to come in for the interview along with the chair of the Board of Deacons. And then once that interview process is over with, and then we have a meeting with all the deacons of the board. Uh, I also appoint a mentor that that person got to be with that had been faithful as a, a person who hold in that office. Because every job you take, you will have a mentor. If you, you go on a job for a while, they'll sign you with somebody. And you have to come back and meet with the pastor every two weeks and give an update report. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you for your expertise. Thank you all. Only thank you for your questions. Thank you for the answers. Uh, panelists, um, I, I just want to applaud you for your expertise that you have given this audience tonight. Um, may God bless each and every one of you. Um, the diaconate as it relates to biblical selection. It is a um, hot topic, but it also is a biblical topic. It's, a, it's very biblical, and so I thank you because that's my cognate in my D-Men program. My cognate is biblical studies, and uh, everything I want to do in this church is I uh, want to be biblical-based. So thank you again for that, audience. Thank you uh, for being here, and I hope that we have said something tonight uh, to encourage your efforts to keep on keeping on uh, in the name of Jesus. Amen.